Hello, everyone. As uh, Justine very clearly exp explained, my research involves solar photovoltaics, a bit of a mouthful, but solar PV for short, with an example of a large solar PV field up there behind me. What I think needs to change in this area is pessimism about the, the prospects of such renewable technology, particularly amongst our decision makers. Why, you may well ask, should we be optimistic? And the reason for this is the costs of such renewable systems have dropped very dramatically over the last two years, particularly solar, and are still dropping very quickly, with none of this yet being factored into the political discussion. This uh, graph here shows recent real-world cost experience with, uh, with solar costs. So shown is actual auction bids for the supply of long-term electricity in different countries of the world. Um, so the red dotted line shows the progress with the solar costs. Um, back two years ago, this side of the graph, solar was relatively expensive with all the potential lying in the future. So you can see that by comparing the solar bids, the red ones, with those from some of the other options, the low bids for some of the other options that are, are shown there. So this is the type of thinking that's reflected in even the most recent government reports, such as the uh, Finkel report in the national electricity market that was published only in June. However, the, the future has arrived much more quickly than expected. In fact, the, the future is here right now. So over the last 18 months, the other side of the graph, solar has become the cheapest way of supplying bulk electricity. So Justine will be interested in this, but compared to the cost of electricity from a new coal-fired plant, the, the present costs of solar are about a third those costs. And perhaps even more importantly, if you look at the opportunity cost of coal, the, the money that you would earn by selling the coal rather than burning it, you can see that some of the bids for the solar systems are, are lower than that. So that means from, from now on, burning coal to make electricity when the sun is shining is a lot like burning dollar notes instead. So, and the other important fact is that rather than having to think about the extra costs of making a transition to a sustainable future, it's now quite realistic to think in terms of the savings that we're going to make by doing that. One reason that the uh, costs have dropped so quickly is the cost of solar modules, shown on the right over there, the most expensive part of the system, have been spiralling downwards due to large-scale manufacturing and improved technology. Um, the blue curve there shows the exponential reduction in solar costs over the last 40 years. So um, last year, the wholesale price of a module decreased by 20%. This year, it's decreased by 30%. Um, the red curve there shows the corresponding increase in the annual production of solar. And uh, that's been growing by quite amazing 40% a year compounded over the last 20 years. So this year, for the first time, we'll produce over 100 gigawatts of photovoltaics in one year and, and install it, um, or, or equivalently, a tenth of a terawatt. Um, that's equivalent in capacity to about 100 large coal-fired power stations. If we can sustain that past growth rate for a little bit longer, until about 2025, we'll then be producing one terawatt a year of photovoltaics and installing it, a very significant number, as we'll soon see. Although many have contributed um, to these recent rapid cost reductions, this university has played a pivotal role. Uh, a key player has been one of our lab's most uh, famous graduates, uh, Dr. Zhengrong Shi, uh, an Australian citizen, also known as the first solar billionaire, shown here uh, as a young student and, of course, holding a solar module. Zhengrong showed uh, considerable initiative in using the skills that he had picked up here in establishing the first solar cell manufacturing in China through an Australian-Chinese joint venture. And the second photo there captures a very historic moment that I obviously was very pleased to be part of. 
the opening of the first solar PV production line in China. Um, in 2002, this was. So Zhengrong was then able to very quickly expand his manufacturing capacity by listing on the New York Stock Exchange and building this very small company up into uh, the world's largest manufacturer. So his uh, initiative was the key to the massive explosion of the industry and to the present low costs that, we, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, on the technology front, the university has already made, or also made significant contributions. So we've held the record for the highest efficiency silicon cell for 30 of the last 34 years. Um, the ultimate cell that we developed, the PERC cell, spelt P-E-R-C, uh, now accounts for most uh, new manufacturing capacity worldwide. So right now, about one in every four cells that are made worldwide use the PERC technology, but due to the rapid uptake, most cells will be PERC by about 2021. Why do we have to quickly change the prevailing political pessimism about the potential of renewables? Uh, this graph, at least the black lines on it, show the global carbon dioxide emissions until 2014, and then an emissions trajectory that would keep a global temperature rise below two degrees centigrade. Uh, you can immediately see the severity of the problem that we're facing. Uh, despite the best efforts of the four biggest polluters, we run into a problem in about 2030 when they'll take up the whole budget to keep on this two degree trajectory. Um, this, this slide was actually made in 2015 and if you remember back to my earlier slide, back then solar was still relatively expensive, so things did look pretty hopeless. But with the recent rapid cost reductions, I think we now have a, have a chance. As I said before, if we can continue the past growth rates for a little bit longer, we should be producing a terawatt a year by 2025. And the um, region to the right there shows the impact of one, installing one terawatt a year would have upon the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions. So you can see it's of the right magnitude to maintain that two degree trajectory and also importantly also on the right time scale. If we look at the source of these CO2 emissions you can see that electrical power generation is the, is the big problem accounting for close to 40 percent of global CO2 emissions. Um, fortunately, that may also be the easiest to address. All we have to do is keep installing more of those large PV systems, such as I showed in the earlier slide, as is happening in many parts of the world, including recently in Australia. However, reducing that huge chunk to a much smaller block will obviously pose um, challenges um, in matching the intermittent daytime generation from solar to the, um, for the, to the demand. So some politicians think that um, making more baseload coal generation plant is the solution. Um, it's definitely not. Um, I think what is really needed is to convert our existing coal plant to make them more flexible so that they can uh, respond better in the, in the network of the future. There are other opportunities in uh, storage so uh, pumped hydro storage is probably going to remain the cheapest option with some interesting new ideas recently um, reported by our colleagues at ANU. So battery costs are also reducing quickly for small scale use, the Tesla type lithium batteries and at the large scale, vanadium flow batteries uh, that were invented here at UNSW by Professor M Maria Skylas Kazakos. Another big um, source of emissions is from transport. It's in fact the next biggest, accounting for about 10% emissions from passenger cars. So just increasing the amount of solar contributing to general electricity generation will automatically uh, displace coal from transport if we go to electric vehicles, which seems to be the solution here. But there may be opportunities for more direct displacement through things like solar carports and solar, car, uh, solar parking stations such as shown here. Um, installing the solar cells on the car itself um, has a surprisingly large potential for impact. 
So the makers of this blue car shown here uh, state that the installing the solar cells you can see on the car panels there will give sufficient energy to drive that car an average of 25 kilometres a day. And that turns out to be quite close to the average daily commuting distance. So a more recent study by Toyota that followed up on this point uh, suggests that um, if solar cells were installed on hybrid cars, that this would be able to reduce passenger car related CO2 emissions by a quite amazing uh, 60%. If we look to the future and um, when we'll be getting to work in a driverless, lightweight pod, uh, watch out, Justin Beaver. <laughs> the solar cells could even be more effective if, if uh, integrated into the, the car body paint or into the windows of a, of a lightweight vehicle like this. Um, just two weeks ago, uh, Tesla launched their electric semi-trailer so, um, you know, this might give an opportunity for solar to, uh, to address another large category of emissions, freight transport shown there as well. So last year, um, most uh, electricity generation capacity installed worldwide and all the new capacity in Australia was from renewables. So with the recent cost reductions, it now seems almost certain that by about 2050, most of our electricity will come from renewables. By sticking our heads in the sand and trying to live in the past, maybe the 2010 that Justine mentioned, um, we are slowing down this transition. We are also re increasing the amount of CO2 that will ultimately build up in the atmosphere and the severity of the consequent impacts from that. We are also isolating our companies and entrepreneurs from the opportunities that arise from being early adopters. That's why I think we have to be realistic about the energy transformation that is gaining momentum daily and very quickly change the prevailing political pessimism about the future of renewables. Thank you.